Welcome to I Teach Video. My name is Neil James. I'm a high school teacher. I teach film production. I've done so for three years. Uh, before that, I taught a class called audiovisual production, which carries over a lot of the same lessons that I've taught over the years. I've decided to bring all of my lessons over to the online world to, to share those lessons with other people and with my students online. So what you're going to get through this course and through this channel is a variety of lessons that I've built over the years to teach people how to analyze and how to produce films, how to analyze professional Hollywood films and films all over the world, and then apply that knowledge to our own independent productions. This is gonna be my first lesson for my first unit that I teach to 11th graders, but it's really going to be a college level course for some folks who've never learned filmmaking before. So what I teach in high school is actually dual credit as a college course. When I introduced this concept of analyzing films and speaking the language of films to students, I like to use this quote from Martin Scorsese. Scorsese is known as a great filmmaker. He's also known as a great film enthusiast. He began by analyzing and writing about film like a lot of filmmakers have in the past. Whenever I hear people dismiss movies as fantasy, Scorsese says, I think to myself that it's just a way of avoiding the power of cinema. And we have no choice but to treat all these moving images coming at us as language. We need to stress visual literacy in our schools. The experience becomes richer when we explore these elements and those tools become a part of our vocabulary that is just as valid as those used in literature. And that's uh, from Martin Scorsese on visual literacy. I'd like to get us started with a couple of questions. Some people refer to filmmaking as the seventh art. So what other forms of art can you think of that came before filmmaking? Some forms of art that might be popping to your head are probably the first thing people think of as portraits or paintings. Some people might even mention photography. It's obviously directly linked to filmmaking, cinematography. Some people might mention music. Obviously music is really important in filmmaking. Others might mention dance. And when it comes to dance choreography, it's similar to how a director would direct their actors because it's all about movement uh, and that movement isn't, isn't important for a stage, but it's important for a set. It's important for the space where you're recording and for the compositions that you want to create with the camera. Some people might mention things like decorating and design. Those are obviously important for filmmaking. Others might mention theater, which is obviously a uh, ancestor of filmmaking and, and theater is still around today. And a lot of people who write for theater go on to write screenplays and even some theatrical productions have been adapted to the big screen. So you could say that theater is directly linked to film as well. Some people might mention sculpting, uh, sketching, drawing, all of these things might come into play when you're making a film. So as you can see, a lot of different art forms are related to filmmaking. Uh, sketching and drawing might come into play as a director trying to plan out your shots and your uh, actors' positions and how you want the set to be designed. And then you might use choreography or some element of choreography if you're creating a fight scene or if you have a lot of movement in a scene or if you have an ensemble scene where there's lots of different actors and you need to make sure that no one's bumping into each other or moving in front of the camera in the wrong way or passing uh, in front of a light in a way that looks unpleasant. When it comes to photography, obviously it's directly linked to cinematography. Cinematography is obviously working with the moving image and photography is with still images, but the principles of lighting and color and composition are going to apply to both photography and cinematography. When it comes to music, obviously music is a big part of a lot of films. Some films don't include music, but uh, music is often used to enhance the mood of a scene uh, or to emphasize the mood of a scene that's already there just to make it more impactful. But sound design as an art form in film, it goes way beyond music. And so we'll learn a lot about sound design and how it can be incorporated in your own film projects. We're going to learn about several things that go back to theater, whether it's screenwriting techniques that go back to writing scripts for theatrical productions, choreographing your actors, laying out, designing your set, designing your props, all of those things go back to some theatrical production techniques. When it comes to painting, um, a lot of directors are inspired by painters as far back as the Renaissance and before that. So um, the language of visual art 
transfers and the inspirations that you can get from other art forms, it's really endless when it comes to filmmaking. So again, Martin Scorsese emphasized the importance of vocabulary when it comes to the language of cinema. And we're gonna be learning a lot of vocabulary in this first unit that's kind of a 101 introduction to filmmaking terminology. And along with that, I'm gonna provide you with some resources that I've crafted over the years, going back to when I taught a class called audiovisual production, and I've refined it and made it better and added visuals and more references and more vocabulary over the years so that we have enough language to talk about anything that we can think of when it comes to filmmaking and what we see in a scene, what we hear, and how it's crafted. So the first link uh, is provided right here. As you can see, you can go ahead and go to that link and open that up to open up the first uh, list of terms that we're gonna, going to be covering. Go ahead and go to that link, open it up and make a copy and store that on your Google Drive. And if you're taking my class, make sure you store that in your film folder. So if you haven't made a film folder yet, go ahead and make that film folder and you're gonna be storing this vocabulary because it will become so useful in every aspect of the course, whether you are analyzing a film or if you're applying a technique or just trying to think of a technique that you could apply to one of your scenes. So uh, now that you've made a copy and you're ready to begin, let's go ahead and begin learning the language of cinema. First up, we have the frame and the frame is going to be the border, uh, all the edges of your shots uh, and the frame is going to determine your composition. Whatever you put in the frame is what's going to be kept and whatever you leave out of the frame is what's not important to your shot. So you can go ahead and practice a little bit of directing right now. You may have seen some famous pictures of Steven Spielberg or other directors uh, doing this, but if you don't have a lens uh, on a mount where you can plan out a shot right now, go ahead and take your fingers, your thumb and your index fingers, touch them to the opposite fingers and look through, uh, close one of your eyes and look through that rectangle. Uh, we're gonna shoot everything for this class horizontally. So kind of gives you an idea of what a widescreen shot would look like. And you can move that around and kind of see how you could compose different images just by choosing what goes in the frame and what stays out of the frame. So again, that's just the border of the image in the camera and on your screen. That's the frame. Okay, we mentioned before that theater is influential when it comes to filmmaking. And one of the ways in which theater is influential in filmmaking is this idea of mise-en-scene. So I've given you the, the actual phrase and then I've given you how to pronounce it. It's mise-en-scene. Uh, so you can practice being a French person if you don't have a French accent and say mise-en-scene. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing a very good job. If you are French, you can tell me whether or not my accent sucks. The meaning of mise-en-scene is to place on stage. When we're talking about filmmaking, we're not talking about an actual stage. So mise-en-scene is gonna be everything inside of the frame. If you think about it as a theatrical production, this is going to be furniture that you put up on the stage. This is gonna be plants or decorations, everything that you're putting on the stage. But Everything else that goes on the stage is included in this. So people, uh, if you have lights on the stage. Um, so basically everything you see on the stage is gonna be the mise-en-scene. And when we talk about it with filmmaking, we're referring to everything you see in the frame. So we've got a term for the outside of the uh, movie image, which is the frame. And then what everything else that's inside of the movie image is going to be the mise-en-scene. Every visible detail inside of the frame is mise-en-scene. So if we look at this image from the Royal Tenenbaums, it's going to not just include the books and the decoration or the decor, it's also going to include the actress herself. Everything we see in the frame is mise-en-scene. So within the topic of mise-en-scene, there's so much to cover. And some of these terms you're already familiar with. And one of those terms is going to be setting. So this is literally where the scene takes place. So your setting could be beside a pool. It could be inside of a room of your house. It could be inside of your school. Uh, your setting could be anywhere that you can physically be. Um, you can also create a setting from scratch. And when we say you're filming on set, that phrase can be used when you're on location at a real place, but, but originally it's referring to literally building a set. 
So most movies back in the early 1900s were literally inside of a big room that was redecorated, redesigned to look like a different location. And a lot of films are still shot that way in Hollywood. Even massive scenery that's not real, that's actually imagined and, and built just for the production. When we refer to set dressing, set dressing is going to be all of the objects that you place around the location. So set dressing is going to refer to furniture. It's going to refer to paintings, decorations, um, literally everything that's used to decorate the location is going to be referred to as set dressing. And maybe one way you could remember this is you're, you're kind of putting a dress on your location. You're giving it clothes. You're giving it um, a unique look so it doesn't just look bare and naked. So uh, that might be a way that you could remember set dressing as the term that you would use to refer to furniture and objects that are placed around your location. Now, when an object is being used by the actors, um, unless it's furniture, we're going to call refer to it as props. So unless someone's literally picking up a chair and throwing it at somebody, uh, a chair is not going to be referred to as a prop. Um, because they're just sitting in it, it's just going to be referred to as set dressing. But everything that an actor actually uses, like their cell phone, if they're talking on their cell phone, a handful of cash, if they've just sold something to someone, anything that they're actually using in the scene, they're sending a letter to someone, the pen, the piece of paper, both of those are going to be referred to as props. And everything that the actors use, it, those will be referred to as props. But you won't call a painting that's just on the wall a prop. You're not going to refer to a chair that's just sitting in the room as a prop. You're not going to refer to um, a shirt that an actor is wearing as a prop. And that's what we have next. Under mise-en-scene, we also have costume. So within the frame, you have the location. You have all of the uh, objects that are set up in the location. And then you have the objects that the actors are wearing. And we're not going to refer to those as props. We're going to refer to those as costumes. And some people are going to call that wardrobe. So with a lot of these terms, you'll see that there's more than one way to refer to them. But you want to make sure that you use the right uh, term and not something that no one else uses. Uh, you don't want to call a jacket a prop. Okay, so that's going to be costume or wardrobe. But we'll use the term costume. The way a character is dressed is going to help define who that character is. So if you look at these images here, you can see that you could design a variety of different characters. The suit and dress might tell you something about a character that the sportswear doesn't tell you about that character. The sportswear is going to tell you that character is athletic um, or trying to get in shape. The suit and dress are probably going to tell you that there's a special occasion for that character or that character is wealthy. The leather jacket and the jeans might give you something about that character's personality as far as attitude. And as you can see, masks, hats, gloves, watches, jewelry, all of those are going to fall into the category of costume. So as you can see within the frame, filmmakers already have a ton of different decisions to make as far as location, set dressing, costume, and props are concerned. I like this quote from Film Studies and Introduction by Ed Seekov. The more mise-en-scene details we add, the more visual information we give to our audience, and the more precise our audience's emotional response will be to the image we are showing them. So our audience is going to have a different emotional reaction depending on the design within the frame. The mise-en-scene that is presented to them will give them different emotional responses without any dialogue, without any sound, without any story. And you already know this from looking at photography. You can look at a photo and it can give you an emotional response without any dialogue or story or sound design. So let's begin using these terms when we're analyzing scenes. Knowing the language not only helps you talk about these things, but it also helps you remember which things can be analyzed when you're watching a scene or when you're looking at an image from a film. So let's go back to that Royal Tenenbaums image. Let's just look at everything within the frame. I want you to simply study this image and tell me what you can gather about this character. What do the things within the frame tell you about this character? Pick one element within this image and interpret it. What does it mean and how does it make you feel? Some of you may have chosen the bookshelf. It stands out, it's big, it's in our face. It's actually taking up most of the frame. We know that this person reads a lot. 
we know that they might be a little bit of a bookworm. See that they're organized meticulously. So this person not only likes to read, but they're also hyper-organized, meticulous in their detail in their organization. If you go even deeper, you can see that each row is labeled with the name of a playwright. So the names of these playwrights indicates to us that this person not only likes to read, but they specifically like to read plays. And we can go even further and say, well, maybe this person likes, wants to write their own play or wants to produce a play or wants to act in plays. What about the wallpaper or the ornate electric candelabra? It might tell us that the character comes from a wealthy family. It really tells us that this character takes herself seriously maybe even has taste in design or certain tastes that's not very childish, it's a little bit more adult. So we have a little bit of a contrast between the idea of adulthood and childhood. This character takes herself very seriously and the decoration and the idea of this organization, all of these factors play into the idea that this character is like an adult, but unlike an adult, the zebra pattern might indicate that there are elements of childhood still there. Uh, like the zebras with their stripes, this character is wearing stripes. So again, the visual language can indicate some association between the character and other elements within the frame. When you start to analyze the character herself, you're delving into some of the terms that we're going to go into next. And that's going to be the mise-en-scene related to the actor. So besides setting, set dressing, props, and costume, let's look at the actor herself. Moving on to facial expression. Facial expression is going to indicate to us a lot about the character's emotion. A lot of acting is facial expression. It's going to be the appearance of the character's face, and that's going to tell us what mood the character is in. Um, so if we think back to the Royal Tenenbaums image, she's got a very serious look on her face as she's reading that play. One way that we convey emotions to other people without using words is through our facial expressions. So directors and actors are going to use facial expressions to convey meaning within the frame. Next up, we have body language. Body language is the posture or gestures of the body that convey the character's feelings. Another way that we convey emotions as humans without using our words is through our body language. Directors and actors can use body language to convey information non-verbally. Next up, we have blocking. Blocking is going to refer to the placement and the movement of the actors within the frame. So it can refer to movement of multiple people within the frame, within the set. You're going to block out a shot, which literally means you're going to plan out where your actors are going to move from spot to spot. Or if your actors are standing still and delivering their lines, you're going to plan that out through blocking to pick out where you want your actors so that you like the composition, you like what you see within the frame and how they're positioned within the frame. Blocking can also convey emotional information. A lot of where you position people is going to change how big or how small they are within the image. And you can also kind of play with that by positioning characters in different ways. Maybe one character standing over another character and that might convey some information about who has the most power in the scene. So there's a lot of psychology when you're planning out your mise-en-scene when it comes to the actors, their facial expressions, their body language, and where you're placing them to convey nonverbal information. It's going into your audience's mind without them even realizing it. And there's a lot of psychology when it comes to filmmaking. You're affecting how people feel, whether they realize it or not, not just with how the story is conveyed, but with what they're seeing within the frame. Now that we have this extra vocabulary to refer to the actor within the category of mise-en-scene, not just for props and set dressing and for costume, but for the actor's facial expression, body language, and blocking, let's apply that to the Royal Tenenbaums image here. The first thing that might stand out is the blocking. You might notice that the character is pushed out to the corner of the image. There's multiple shelves of books beside her and a shelf of books above her, and she's pushed into the corner. It's almost like she's being closed in by all of these books that she's been reading. Also with her body language, we can tell that she's sitting upright, so she's not slouching or um, falling asleep or dozing off. She, the book has her attention, and she's sitting not just uh, with, at attention, but also with a posture that indicates she's maybe uh, in her mind a little bit older than she appears to be. She takes herself seriously. 
What about facial expression? Again, with the facial expression here, we can tell that she's engrossed in what she's reading, that she's focused, that she's really uh, paying attention to what she's reading. She's really invested in what she's reading. Everything we've learned about this character in the Royal Tenenbaums can be conveyed without having ever seen the movie before. I can confirm that all the information that we've gathered is relevant to this character because I've seen the movie. But even if you hadn't seen the Royal Tenenbaums, just by having this knowledge of how you can analyze a frame using the vocabulary of mise-en-scene, you can already learn a lot about this character without having heard her speak or seeing her act at all. So just remember that the more details you add to the mise-en-scene, the more we can add to the visual information that we're giving the audience. And by giving the audience, it's not blatant and in their face. It's hidden, it's built in, it's encrypted into the image. So you can, with careful detail, enhance an audience's experience without them even knowing that you're doing that if they don't know these techniques. And one thing that you'll realize as you follow along with this course, uh, you will begin to analyze films that you're not even intending to analyze. And you will kind of uh, break a little bit of that magic um, by understanding what's being done behind the scenes. But at the same time, you're going to be able to see so many opportunities for ideas that you can incorporate into your own filmmaking. So knowing how to analyze films is going to help you tremendously and understanding the language of cinema that's hidden below the surface. It's not just the language of the dialogue of the characters or the language of the camera, but it's also what's within the frame. It's all of the costumes, the props, the facial expression, the body language, the location choice. Um, all of those factor in the character movement, where they're placed within the frame, even in relation to other characters. All of this is going to be hidden information to the audience that's not blatant and in their face like story and dialogue, it's actually going to be information that goes kind of into their psyche so that it hits them emotionally even though they might not realize it. So let's continue analyzing some frames and see what you can pull out using this visual language. In the comments, I want you to give me some details that you pick up on, something that you notice about each image. So I'm going to give you images from different movies. I'll tell you the titles of the movies and you can refer to one of the titles of the movies and point out some of the visual information that you're getting through the mise-en-scene. So we're not gonna focus on sound or movement because this is just gonna be a still image. We're gonna focus on mise-en-scene, everything within the frame. Specifically, I want you to focus on setting, set dressing, props, costume, body language, facial expression, and blocking. So this first image is from The Searchers, a 1956 film. Take some time to really analyze the mise-en-scene. Remember, we can analyze setting, set dressing, costume, props, body language, facial expression, and blocking. Obviously, we can't see the actor's face here, so that's gonna be off the table. And the actor's not holding anything, so we're not gonna to refer to props. But what about the setting? What do you notice? What does it tell you? What about the set dressing? What do you notice decorating the setting. What does it tell you? What about the costume? What do you notice? What does it tell you about the character? What about the character's body language? What do you notice? What do you think the character is doing? What about the blocking? Where the character is placed in relation to everything else in the frame? What does it tell you? This next image is from The Shawshank Redemption. It's a 1994 film. Again, I want you to analyze the mise-en-scene in this image. If you've seen the movie, just pretend like you haven't. What does this image convey to you? Just looking at what's in the frame, what can you tell about the characters? Remember, go through the list. The setting. The set dressing. The props. The costume. The body language. The facial expression the blocking. What does this visual information tell you about the characters, their relationship, and the world they live in? Next up, we have an image from Get Out. This is a 2017 film. Many of you may have seen this. Let's pretend like you haven't. Just looking at this image, what information can you gather through the mise-en-scene? What nonverbal information is being sent to you through the image? Remember, you wanna focus on the setting, the set dressing, the costume, the body language, the facial expression, and the blocking. What do the setting, set dressing, costume, body language, facial expression, and blocking tell you about this character? 
Next up, we have David Fincher's Fight Club from 1999. What is the visual information that you're picking up on here that falls under the category of mise-en-scene? What does it tell you about the character and the emotions that are being conveyed? What is the visual information that's being conveyed through the mise-en-scene? This one's a fun one, especially since most people watching this video probably haven't seen this film. This is a foreign film called The Color of Paradise from 1999. So looking at this image, it's a bit of a puzzle for you if you haven't seen the, the film. What does the visual information tell you about this character in red? Pay attention to the props and pay attention to all of the character's body language and facial expression. The actor in red is portraying a character that's different than his classmates in a very specific way. What can you tell about this character without ever watching the movie just by looking at this single frame? Next up, we have The Shape of Water. This film's from 2017. Looking within the frame, studying the mise-en-scene, use some visual language to interpret this shot. What does it tell you about the character? If you've seen this movie or you've seen the trailer for this movie, you know that there's like a hybrid fish man living in this scientific lab. You can see him behind the lead uh, actor's arm as she is leaning back. What does her body language and facial expression and the blocking between all three characters convey to you about their relationships. What about the other mise-en-scene elements? What about the location, the set dressing, the costume? What emotional information could these convey? And what visual information is embedded in the design of this image? Next up, we have an image from Apocalypse Now, a 1979 film. What visual information is conveyed about this character in the center through his body language, facial expression, blocking, and costume. What do the setting, set dressing, and props tell us about these characters and their environment, and what they're going through? What emotions are conveyed with the visual language of this image? Next up, we have an image from Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, 2004 film. Look at the visual information that's conveyed through this image, through the body language, facial expression, costumes, location, Set dressing, what information can you gather about these characters without ever having seen the film just by looking at this image? What about their personality traits? Stands out to you through their costumes, body language, and facial expressions. What about their relationship stands out to you? Next up, we have an image from Silence of the Lambs, a 1991 film. What does the mise-en-scene, the visual information, convey to you without ever having seen the film? If you just look at this one image, what emotional information is the director trying to convey through the blocking body language, facial expression, costumes, and setting? Focus on the character in the center. She is the protagonist of this film. What is the director conveying about her relationship in the law enforcement community, about her place in the world of law enforcement? Next up, we have an image from Chunking Express, a 1994 film. Look at the mise-en-scene within this image. What does it convey to you? What is the blocking, the costume, the body language and the facial expression convey to you as a viewer? Next up, we have an image from Paths of Glory, 1957 film. If you have never seen Paths of Glory or if you hadn't seen it, what does this one image convey to you through visual language? What do the Props, location, body language, set dressing, costumes, facial expressions, and blocking convey to you as a viewer. Next up, we have an image from Schindler's List, a 1993 film. What does the location, costume, body language, props, facial expression, and blocking convey to you as a viewer? So we just brainstormed the emotional and psychological impact of mise-en-scene within a still image. In the next exercise, I want you to do the opposite. I'm going to give you the emotional and psychological impact. I want you to imagine the mise-en-scene. I want you to draw an image in your mind. Maybe you want to list some things on a piece of paper or draw something out as well. So here's your chance to create a shot and imagine it in your mind. I want you to just pretend like you're not actually going to shoot this. It's make-believe. So you can use 
any props, any set dressing, any costumes. They don't have to be available to you. Get creative. Imagine a shot that could psychologically and emotionally convey this information without any words. So I want you to imagine each of these things. I want you to have a setting, set dressing, costume, props, body language, facial expression, and blocking. Go ahead and take some notes on these things and imagine each scenario. So imagine uh, what those things would be and leave a comment listing what different setting, set dressing, costume, props, body language, facial expression, and blocking you would use in your shot to convey this information. Just imagine an imaginary film that you could make if you had unlimited funds or unlimited resources. So here's scenario one. For scenario one, I want you to convey that a dangerous, formidable, confident character is in their place of power or their domain. Again, this is a dangerous, formidable, confident person in their place of power or domain. Imagine what setting, set dressing, costume, props, body language, facial expression, and blocking you could devise to convey this information, this psychological and emotional information to your audience without using any words, any dialogue or story. I am asking you to convey information about one character, but you can include other characters within the frame to convey that information about the main character. Have you got your list? Go ahead and post that in the comments below for scenario one. All right, for scenario two, I want you to imagine an innocent, sweet, harmless character is in an unfamiliar, unpleasant setting. Again, for scenario two, I want you to convey the innocence and the sweetness and the harmlessness of a character in an unfamiliar, unpleasant setting using only visual language. What setting could you use? What set dressing? What props? What costume? What body language, what facial expression, and what blocking could you use? You can include more than the main character within the frame. All right, here's our final scenario. For scenario three, this is gonna be our most complicated one. Character A is going to be moody, uptight, and harsh. For character B, they're going to be practical, smart, and put together. These two characters are in a chaotic, wild setting. Go ahead and give me a list of details for each character and the location. So you want your chaotic, wild location. You might want to choose a specific setting and specific set dressing to convey that information. You can also use the character's body language and facial expressions to convey that information that it's a chaotic, wild setting. But you might want to save that to convey the information about their psychology. Remember, character A is going to be moody, uptight, and harsh. Remember. Character B is going to be practical, smart, and put together. How would you convey that information through costume, props, body language, facial expression, and blocking? So now that you've had a little taste of what it's like to be a director, planning out a, a scene that conveys the emotional and psychological information that you want to convey to your audience non-verbally, let's take one more crack at analysis before we end today's lesson. Notice that there's some similarities between the mise-en-scene of these two images. What are the similarities? Now, although these images have similar details, the psychological impact of these two images is different. How is your emotional or psychological reaction to image A different than your emotional or psychological reaction to image B? What are the subtle differences between these two images that change your emotional or psychological reaction? Remember, all of these details that we're focused on fall into the category of mise-en-scene. And today's lesson on mise-en-scene has introduced you to seven different vocab terms that you can use when you're writing an analysis about a scene or even just a single image within a film. Thank you for watching lesson one of unit one of my film class. I hope you enjoyed it. You're going to learn even more about analyzing film in lesson two.